irony, from my perspective, is that the only people who seem to generally agree with me and who think that there are right and wrong answers to moral questions are religious demagogues of one form or another. And of course, they think they have right answers to moral questions because they got these answers from a voice in a whirlwind. Okay, not because they made an intelligent analysis of the causes and condition of, of, of human and animal well-being. And in fact, the, the, the endurance of religion as a, as a lens through which most people view moral questions has separated most moral talk from real questions of human and animal suffering. I mean, this is why we spend our time talking about things like gay marriage and not about genocide or nuclear proliferation or poverty or any other hugely consequential issue. But the, the, the demagogues are right about one thing. We need a universal conception of human values. Now, what stands in the way of this? Well, one thing to notice is that we, we do something different when talking about morality, especially secular academic scientist types. When talking about morality, we value differences of opinion in a way that we don't in any other area of our lives. So, for instance, the Dalai Lama gets up every morning meditating on compassion and he thinks that helping other human beings is an integral component of human happiness. Okay. On the other hand, we have someone like Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy was very fond of abducting and raping and torturing and killing young women. Okay, so we appear to have a genuine difference of opinion about how to profitably use one's time. Okay. <laughs> Most Western intellectuals look at this situation and say, well, there's nothing for the Dalai Lama to be really right about, really right about, or for Ted Bundy to be really wrong about that admits of a, uh, of a real argument that, that, that it potentially falls within the purview of science. Okay, that we, you know, he likes chocolate, he likes vanilla. There's, a, there's, no, there's nothing that one should be able to say to the other that should persuade the other. Now notice that we don't do this in science. On the left you have Edward Witten. He's a string theorist. If you ask the smartest physicists around, who's the smartest physicist around? In my experience, half of them will say Ed Witten. The other half will tell you they don't like the question. <clears throat> so, what would happen if I showed up at a physics conference and said string theory is bogus? You know, it doesn't resonate with me, it's not how I choose to view the universe at the smallest scale. I'm not a fan. Okay, well, <clears throat> well, nothing would happen because I'm not a physicist. I don't understand string theory. I I'm the Ted Bundy of string theory. Okay? I wouldn't want to belong to any string theory club that would have me as a member. Okay. But this is just the point. Okay. Whenever we are talking about facts, certain opinions must be excluded. That is what it is to have a domain of expertise. That is what it is for knowledge to count. How have we convinced ourselves that in the moral sphere there is no such thing as moral expertise or moral talent or moral genius even? How have we convinced ourselves that every opinion has to count? How have we convinced ourselves that, that every culture has a point of view on these subjects worth considering? Does, does the Taliban have a point of view on physics that is worth considering? No. Okay. How, is, how is their ignorance, how is their ignorance any less obvious on the subject of human well-being? So, so this, I, I think, is what the world needs now. It needs people like ourselves to admit that there are right and wrong answers to questions of human flourishing. And morality relates to that domain of facts. It is possible for individuals and even for whole cultures to care about the wrong things. Which is to say, it's possible for them to have beliefs and desires that reliably lead to needless human suffering. Just admitting this will transform our discourse about morality. Okay, we, we live in a, in, a, in a world in which the boundaries between nations mean less and less and they will one day mean nothing. We live in a world filled with destructive technology and this technology cannot be uninvented. It, it will always be easier to break things than to fix them. Okay, it seems to me therefore patently obvious that we can no more respect and tolerate vast differences in, in notions of human well-being than, than we can respect or tolerate vast differences in the notions about how disease spreads 
or in the, in the safety standards of buildings and airplanes. We simply must converge on the answers we give to the most important questions in human life. And to do that, we have to admit that these questions have answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a question. Sure. So, some um, combustible material there. Yeah. Um, I don't, whether in this audience or people elsewhere in the world hearing some of this, may well be doing the screaming with rage thing right, after as right. well, some of them. Language seems to me is really important here. You, you, when you're talking about um, the veil, you're talking about women dressed in cloth bags. You know, I've lived in the Muslim world, spoken with a lot of Muslim women, and some of them would say something else. They would say, no, you know, this is a celebration of uh, female specialness. It helps build that, and it's an expression, it's a result of the fact that, and this is arguably a sophisticated psychological view, that male lust is not to be trusted. Right. I mean, can you engage in a conversation with that kind of woman without seeing kind of cultural imperialist? Yeah, well, I, I think this is, I, I tried to broach this in a sentence watching the clock ticking, but the, um, the question is, what is voluntary in a context where men have certain expectations and certain, uh, and you're guaranteed to be treated in a certain way uh, if you don't veil yourself. And so if anyone in this room wanted to wear a veil or a very funny hat or tattoo their faces, or I mean, I think we should be free to voluntarily do whatever we want, but we have to be honest about the constraints that these women are placed under. And, and so I, I think we shouldn't be so eager to always take their word for it, especially in, you know, when it's 120 degrees out and you're, you're wearing a full burqa. A lot of people you know, want to believe in this, this concept of moral progress, um, but can you reconcile that? I think I understood you to say that you could reconcile that with a, with a world that doesn't become one-dimensional, where we right. all have to think the same. Paint your picture of what, you know, rolling the, the clock 50 years forward, 100 years forward, how you would like to think of the world, balancing moral progress with richness? Well, I think once you admit that we are on path toward understanding our minds at the level of the brain in some important detail, then you have to admit that, that uh, we are going to understand all of the positive and negative qualities of ourselves in much greater detail. So we're going to understand positive social emotion, like empathy and compassion. And we're going to understand the factors that encourage it, whether they're genetic, whether they're uh, how people talk to one another, whether they're economic systems. And insofar as we begin to shine light on that, we are inevitably going to converge on, on that fact space. I mean, so everything is not going to be up for grabs. It's not going to be like, you know, veiling my daughter from birth is just as good as, as uh, teaching her to, to be confident and and well-educated in the context of men who do desire women. You know, so it's, 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 it's we are, I, I mean, I don't think we need an NSF grant to know that veiling, compulsory veiling is a bad idea. But at a certain point, we're gonna be able to scan the brains of everyone involved and actually interrogate them. You know, I mean, do, do people love their daughters uh, just as much in these, in these systems? Uh, and I think, I think they're right, clearly right answers to that. And if the results come out that actually they do, are you prepared to shift your instinctive current judgment on some of these issues? Well, yeah, modulo one obvious fact that you can love someone in the context of a truly delusional belief system. So that you can say like, because I, I knew my gay son was gonna go to hell if he, if he found a boyfriend, I chopped his head off and that was the most compassionate thing I can do. If you get all those parts aligned, yes, I think you could probably be feeling the emotion of love. But again, then we have to talk about well-being in a larger context. You know, and it's, it's all of us in this together. It's not one uh, man feeling ecstasy and then blowing himself up on a bus. Uh, Sam, this is a conversation I, I would actually love to continue for hours. Uh, we don't have that, but yeah. maybe another time. Thank you for yeah, coming today. Really an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.